So my name is Dennis DeSantis. Uh, I do a lot of moderating for, for this event, and I work for Ableton. And for a few years now, we've been thinking about this idea of what it means to get stuck creatively and how to get unstuck again. And a lot of the thinking at Loop is around this topic, like artists at all levels, from beginners to top tier professionals, have creative blocks and they have to resolve them. And we know that they do resolve them because people keep making records. So I'm here with three very interesting, very different artists, um, producers, composers, performers, who are making it work somehow, despite tension, insecurity, fear, uncertainty, doubt, and then also success. So please welcome Kaki King, Travis Stewart, and Jesse Abiomi. So I wanted to start with a question for you, Kaki, because I think this is super interesting. You performed last night. Were any of you at Kaki's performance last night? Also, cheap applause. Um, <laughs> I think we were, no, I mean, it was easy to get applause because it was amazing. And I think many of us in the audience were sort of spellbound at the musical mastery and the technical proficiency and the, the whole package of the thing. It was this really, I'm not just trying to shower you with praise. You, but keep go it going. on, go on. But it was this really beautiful <laughs> thing that felt completely in command. And then at the end, you stood up and said, by the way, I'm going to do a talk tomorrow about insecurity. <laughs> well, that's what you kept talking about. <laughs> right. But I think it's amazing to think, like, we all watch this beautiful thing happen, and there's something for you to be insecure about. Always. And I want to start Right now, it's that. my makeup. Right now, it's your makeup, which, is, which is, looks fine from here. Thank you. Way. Well, I just hired someone to teach me how to do makeup, because I just never did it. And now I'm like... Oh, no, it's fine. Okay. It's fine. It's fine. Right? <laughs> I'm getting, but, you know, I'm almost 40. It's okay. But what does it mean to be, you know you can play the guitar pretty well, right? I can. Okay. At this point, I do. For a okay. long time, I was like, eh, just do it differently. But now I know I do it well. So what does it, what's insecure? What feels insecure to you? Oh, um, that the, it's all about, that, that nothing you're doing now, nothing I'm doing now, is it really the, 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 the important thing. The important thing is the thing I'm going to do next, which will prove that the thing that I did now is awesome. And I mean that in terms of, like, that somehow the next project gets to line up against everything I've ever done and is better, more interesting, more broad, different, yet somehow using the same materials. And if I don't correctly do that next project perfectly, if it's a failure, then it just takes everything I've ever done and just smushes it down. And I think that that, you know, I've seen that happen to some people where they come up with a really very terrible album and you're like, oof. And it's hard to overlook. It's like, oh, we'll just, you know, pretend that didn't happen. And I've done terrible albums that have made me feel like, why did I, well, that was a dumbass thing to do. <laughs> Were they also received terribly? Or yes. Did you, okay. <laughs> So, but then you feel like it takes the career back a notch and you have to I work think that, that much that, harder? But that's just perception. The perception is that I have I've made a mistake, I failed in my experimentation, and therefore the next thing is the only thing that is, is important enough to care about. So right now, the project that you saw last night, I'm over it. I'm done. Like that, I can do it in my sleep. I, I, love, I love playing this, the show, and I love doing it, and I love putting as much improvisation into it as possible. But... Um, for me, the, 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 the fear and insecurity I have right now in my life is of how do I then outdo that? Because it's a pretty great show. And do I tangentially break off and do something different? Or do I take the material that I've already, all the new information, all the new knowledge that I've got together, and do I do something bigger? Um, more expensive to tour, more production involved? Um, and I don't know the answer yet. I'm real insecure about it. And Travis, when we talked, you mentioned that you had watched this TED Talk from Elizabeth Gilbert, the right. author of oh Eat, God. Pray, Love. We have the yeah. same therapist. Don't tell her that. You and Elizabeth have the same therapist? Yeah. Oh, I, if you watch this video, Elizabeth, now you're outed. <laughs> um, I just saw her in the waiting room. It was amazing. <clears throat> Once she touched my forehead, that's another story. Sorry. I want to hear that story. <laughs> um, but I think it's sort of a, it's a, it's a different thing there, right? Because she had written this amazingly successful book, and yeah. then she did this TED Talk about, like, what do you do when you did an amazingly successful thing? Yeah. You're terrified of, of blowing it, right? Right. 
And did you have an experience parallel to this in your own career? Definitely. You know, I, I had um, uh, experience what I considered a failure in, in trying to reach a certain sound, or, or I was trying too hard to maybe create this um, uh, like experimental pop sound, or like really make it in New York and like you know become known as like a, a producer and work, working with rappers and stuff. And I j just was approaching it in the wrong way, and just like couldn't really figure out how to take that next step creatively and kind of take things up to the next level. And then when I watched that talk, she just, um, like one thing that really stuck with me that she said was, instead of looking internally for the creativity, you have to like just let it come to you externally and you, can, uh, you have to basically just do everything in your power to um, like make sure you're practicing and educating yourself so that when those moments come, you know what to do with it and then you can put it uh, into... Mm -hmm you know, actually, actually manifest it into something real. Mm -hmm. Jesse, I'm curious if you, I, I don't know that much about your career trajectory, but I know that you're, you have your own label mm -hmm. and things are going relatively well for you right now. Are you, have you also experienced a success from which you have to recover? Um, yeah, absolutely. Actually, from the beginning of this year, it's been uh, also because of work and stuff like that, it's been actually really difficult to find the balance between sort of just getting creative in a certain space, time space and making sure that that's something that you want to keep moving with. So, um, yeah, I also remember this TED talk and I also felt exactly the same thing. It's like, it's a very seasonal experience, I think. But in between those seasons, it's really important to, yeah, as you said, educate and, and learn other things. It also maybe move away from the things that you actually, to the sort of complete opposite of the things that you're actually trying to achieve. So whether that's, you know, in art or anything else, you know, that, that takes your interest, that you kind of, um, I don't know if it's like a, a absorbing sort of latent creativity from other things and then expressing that through what you're doing. So that's kind of been what I experienced the most this year is that for quite a long period, I couldn't get things done the way I wanted to do them. And then all of a sudden, letting go a little bit more of this, okay, I have to do this now, I've only got a week to try and get things done, I've got deadlines here and here that I've set for myself, not even externally. Um, that made it a lot easier. So I want to I wanna open that up to the whole group, actually, this idea. Goldie said this in the talk before he, was, he played a piece of music and then he was talking about, in general, it didn't come from me. This mm -hmm. idea that he's tapping into something, and Travis, you and I talked about this too. Right. But I want to open this as a sort of general topic. Are you making the music, or is the music there and you grab it? Yeah, I, I don't think I'm doing it. I mean, I, my instrument's guitar, so I've been playing guitar since I was four years old. So that's 34 years of guitar playing. And at this point, I very much know that the guitar is in control. And I think it's a result of playing it for so long that, you know, in composing especially, the guitar will sort of naturally tell me where to go instead of me having to think about, even like, I don't even think about which note I want to do next. It's the guitar simply says, well, like, just because we normally do this, and so just let's do that. And or think about, you know, jumping down eight frets instead of six, and that, you know, now we're a whole step lower than we wanted, than you thought you wanted to be, but I like it better. So, that, so for me, like, I have fully submitted to the instrument. And I have a lot of gratitude for that because it's made me feel like, great, I have no, I have no control. Um, but one of the things that, that Elizabeth Gilbert talks about is showing up, showing up for work. Mm -hmm. And the way I show up for work is I pick up the guitar. <clears throat> right. And I have some sort of you know, stability and you know, quiet time to play. And, and that's like how I begin. Um, but no, I don't think the music comes from me or my knowledge or my ability, you know, the things I've listened to or studied, like none of that. It's like the guitar is sort of just saying, we're going to do this and that, and then you're going to try this, and it's going to speed up a bit, and I have relinquished the idea that I have control. I, this idea that you've sort of anthropomorphized the guitar was also in your, mm -hmm. in your show last night, right? Yeah. This sort of comic interlude where the guitar goes on the journey. I mean, it could have been autobiographical, I don't know. So Maybe, I have right? Sort of awkward, but, awkward adolescence. Hmm? <laughs> well, and wh what about you guys? Well, I think that really plays into, 
how production works as well, because you know, you're essentially using the computer and your software as an instrument. And coming from an instrumental background, I uh, played guitar and piano at an early age. I've always had uh, this, these moments where when I'm playing the instrument and I start thinking about what I'm playing, that's when I screw up. And mm -hmm. the same kind of applies to production. When you start thinking too hard about what you're doing, then that can kind of stunt your progress and uh, can, can hinder you from like really tapping into that creative pool that's like you're, you're in it and then as soon as you start to think about it, it's just like you're disrupting everything. Anything from yeah, you? Justin? I think it's pretty similar. I think what I've noticed is retrospectively, I've wondered like how did I get to this particular sort of result? Especially if I've, um, you know, using that example of showing up to work. If you're regularly doing something, then as you start to sort of look back, and if you're not too in control of what you're doing, it's interesting then to see, you know, how did I think of this? And mm -hmm. I don't have so much of a formal musical background, but um, I've always noticed that I need to play with things in some way and really interact with them in, so that I'm not thinking, I'm not necessarily trying to get a particular sound or if I'm jumping to something that's maybe just a stock preset, I'm still just trying to make the most out of that particular thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thinking is bad. <laughs> it is. Like over overthinking. Overthinking, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, I mean, there's probably comes a point though where if the guitar is telling you what to do, some of this is a relation, it has something to do with your level of technique, or? I think it's just, you know, for me, listen, I'm, I, I don't have any living memory of not knowing how to play guitar, so this right. is, it's really, for me, it, and it's always, and it, and it hasn't always been my best friend, like it's often a sort of antagonist in my life, um, but, uh, I, and I, and I, I think maybe the metaphorical stance that I have about the guitar having control relieves me of the pressure to do better, newer, more creative. It sort of allows the, the pressure on me that I put on myself that I feel from the accolades or the like hyperbolic quotations about God knows what. Um, it just says, like, that's not really you. You just need to you know, again, show up, play, do well, take the next right step, do, the, do your best, learn a new thing. Um, and, and I think so, to just psychologically for me, it just says the pressure's off you. Like, you're cool. You've been playing and working very hard at this for such a long time that now you can just, you know, turn up to work, use your set of tools, and write what's needed to write that day. And, uh, that's kind of where I am right now in my life. I mean, this may change. Maybe not. Um, so some artists talk about how ideas just appear. I mean, that's sort of what we're, we're dealing with here. Like, you're all working at a relatively high level with your tools. Relatively. I think we're all very high. High level. <laughs> well, I mean, you know what you're doing. Low right? functioning, high right. level. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is you don't have to worry about what to touch to make the thing do what you want to right. do. Mm -hmm. This is something that a, a beginning musician or a beginning producer mm -hmm. of course. has to think about. Like, not only do I have to channel these musical ideas, I also have to know what does that button do? Yeah. Is, is there a minimum amount of button knowledge that is necessary before you get to the point where the ideas just start happening? I think you have to really develop a relationship with whatever it is you're using for a longer period of time. Right. And I think that's really difficult sometimes, especially when there's just so much on offer. Always like, new stuff coming yeah. out. Like, yeah. Exactly, and you really have to limit yourself. If it's a drum machine or an instrument like a guitar or um, a synth or, or a plug-in for that matter, you know, it's like um, a good example, like someone like Recondite, you know, just using Operator to the absolute max to create his sound. And not only is this a signature sound, but he probably knows pretty much everything that he needs to do with it. And there are loads of other musicians, whether it's they're playing a traditional instrument or digital or sort of electronic. I think that's really important. I think it's important also, you know, to master what you have, as opposed to think that if you only had a better thing, that you would sound better. Like, like. I made the mistake, well, not the mistake exactly, but I, I opened a studio recently, and mainly I cater to guitar players because I have a lot of very beautiful high-end guitars, and, you know, so it's very simple recording style, but I kept thinking, oh, if I only had 
this microphone. If I only had, you know, if I could just, you know, I should switch from Pro Logic to Pro Tools because of some mysticism that other people were doing it and they, their stuff was cooler. And really, like, I just said, no, 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 I need to master exactly the things that I have out, until I've outgrown them, until I know the next thing that I need, as opposed to, like, oh, if I had, now I gotta go buy this thing and that person uses that plugin and that's cool, you know, just, just work with what you know and what you already have until you realize I need something way better because this is some, I, you know, this is worthless to me. And yeah. um, rather and you can than slowly build on, yeah, to it build on to it as opposed to decide like, well, I need the you know rack of plugins that my favorite producer uses, therefore I can be, I can sound like that. I mean, it's like, it's like people buying, ten, like buying running shoes and thinking they're going to run fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, like in a way, you know, it's like use your body, use what you already have and use the shitty shoes you own and then when you're, when you're like, wow, I can't run any faster, I should get some better shoes. Like that's yeah. the point where you get the upgrade. So you reach the boundaries of what the current tools can do. Yeah, but don't right. buy a really crappy guitar. Spend at least $500. <laughs> yeah, there's Below kind of, that is just pathetic. There's a minimum. Yeah. There is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you... Act, this is an open question for all of you again. Are you actively trying to have a sound or are you trying to get away from having a sound? Or is that the wrong way of framing the problem? Mm, I, like I definitely that. don't. I'm not trying to have a sound. I think it, it happens naturally if you do what, like you were saying, like uh, I guess all of us are saying, like master what you have in front of you. And um, then that kind of becomes part of your sound because of your particular way that you approach that instrument or approach the software, or production techniques, things that you just keep coming back to that, um, you know, just seem natural to you. Mm. Yeah, I, th I'm, I think as a solo guitarist without singing, because singing is like the, you know, the ultimate signifier. Like you open your mouth and you know who's talking, you know who's singing. And when, do you guys do any vocals? No. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for the most part of my career, I've been a, a non-singer guitar player, and to develop my own voice in that world was, I think that looking back now, I say I always had it, but that was the thing I always wanted to prove, was that somehow I can play this instrument that everyone's heard, you know, thousands of times, and, and sometime in the future, I'll be able to write a song and people will know that it's just me. And, um, and I actually got there quicker than I thought. It, I thought it took me 10 years. It really, when I listened to my second album, I'm like, oh no, that's definitely, that couldn't have been anyone else. Mm. Um, but, I, but yeah, definitely the goal, I think specific to people who don't sing, is to, to have that voice that we lack <laughs> because we're not putting our voice on um, and, the, and the challenge that has. Um, but yeah, but it's just kind of like the same kind of thing. Like, you know, use the tools that we're familiar with, go, you know, return to the same types of productions, the same phrasing, the same like little tricks that we know, and then suddenly you're making tracks that sound like yourself. Yeah, yeah. don't consciously try to make that because that's usually... Yeah, because then it's lame. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, and people can tell yeah. you know, that, that you're yeah. trying too hard to achieve a certain sound rather yeah. than just letting it happen naturally, just based on your influences, based on yeah, your dedication and showing up to work and just like... Um, putting forth the effort, and I think it, yeah, just the, the sound comes naturally from all of that. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think rather than looking for a sound, I'm all, my sort of reference is always to be able to say, am I still telling a story with what I'm producing? Because I don't use any vocals, so I think if I know I'm telling a story in some way that is familiar to me, I think that's my voice and that's what I want to achieve rather than saying, okay, you know, my drums sound like this or my synths sound like this, and, or, you know, you can always expect that lead sound. I know it's kind of maybe beneficial if you have that, but I think um, it's also fun to be able to explore different ways of telling things that you want to express. I want to pick up this storytelling thread because I think this is a really interesting, a really interesting angle. There's, I mean, there's more than two camps, but there are many people who are saying, no, nope, my music is always about something in the world, something beyond the music. And I mean, specifically for instrumental music, because mm. if you're saying words, you are telling a story, unless the words are not. wildly abstract, right. <laughs> but if you have, if in purely instrumental music, it's possible to say, I'm not 
this is about music about itself. This is music about its own sound. And I'm interested in where you fall on this spectrum and or if it changes from project to project. Hmm. With the show that I just did, it's very different <coughs> because I've incorporated this, you know, alarming amount of visual elements that run from animation to film to, and, um, but in most of the show, it's, it's still told and abstract, but actually what few people know is that I did write a script, and the script was what enabled me to, like, pin each piece to the next and say to an animator, for instance, I'm not interested in like this specific look being perfect. Here are my sketches, here are my ideas, here are things that I've pulled, my image boards or whatever crap. And, uh, the, but the concept is that we're at the point where the guitar has uh, gotten to the place of higher learning and it's understanding mathematics and it's understanding, um, you know, in, in, instead of just having limbs and eyes and ways of understanding the world, it suddenly has, you know, ability to understand systems. And um, so I, so in, in a way, like, the storytelling is very new for me. Previous to this show, I was very adamant that songs, even with, even songs with vocals, were always to be interpreted to the audience. So that there was no real meaning, um, there was no fixed meaning, I'll say. Um, because I would, because if I sort of prepare someone in advance and that's not the feeling they attach to it, I think there's a little danger there. And I've always loved that music feels so emotional to me and, and can kind of hone in on really specific emotions for me, not just sadness, but despair, or not just joy, but like, in, you know, joy with like almost this hint of it's going to be taken away soon. And, um, and so I like to you know, allow as much openness and freedom for people to feel whatever they need to feel that day. Any other thoughts? You meant specifically mentioned storytelling, so I'm yeah. interested in what, what so, story are you telling? I'm not quite sure exactly what it is, but it's definitely a lot of influences. I mean, a lot of science fiction, I think, is, mm -hmm. is definitely, and also the world, how, you know, growing up watching a lot of science fiction films as a kid, and seeing that that world is actually becoming a reality and sort of taking, or you know, kind of uh, fantasizing on certain aspects of that and, and in incorporating that into the music. Um, that's always been one thing, but also because, you know, from the stuff that I, pro the techno that I produced is also very much influenced from nature. So just that sort of story of our interaction with, with where we are, sort of in sort of, geographically and also how we tr treat the planet and how pan planet treats us. So, um, yeah, d sometimes I think it's a little bit like taking a snapshot and trying to explain it to someone long distance or something who can't see it, so it's a little bit... Or well, sometimes it's really like a narrative, or at least I feel it's like a narrative, especially because it's so drum-heavy. You, know, um, you know, drum culture for me was always the first form of long distance, longer distance communication. So that's always something that I think subconsciously is in my mind that I'm trying to sort of work that out. Yeah, I th for me, uh, whenever I'm working on an album, I find that um, the story kind of presents itself um, just from having this whole unconscious way of, of working on music and just like, you know, how uh, basically when I'm working on a song, I go into a trance and then I come out of the trance with a, a song idea in front of me the same kind of thing happens with an album. I, I, you know, spend a certain amount of time, like weeks or months, on an album, and I don't. I'm not really applying like a specific story or narrative to it. But then I just find that it's it, it manifests from just like not thinking about it too much and just uh, letting it all happen. And then I start to like piece together how the songs interact with each other, and and then that's the fun part, actually putting together the album so that it kind of has a, these emotional arcs as you're uh, listening back to it. And, um, but I think it could be interesting to, to have more of an intention and in putting that into uh, an instrumental album and having you know, uh, the sonic narrative um, 
represent that initial idea that you have, that you're putting into it. And I think that's really interesting. Is there a specific way that you begin a new project? Or does this differ from project to project? <laughs> I think it's different. <laughs> For me, it's different. It's definitely, yeah. Like, uh, it's, I, I think that's what makes writing a new album exciting, is changing up things, de definitely incorporating the things that you're really good at, but you know, maybe introducing some new element or a new environment or something like that, so that it inspires uh, a new direction, or um, yeah, just like makes you excited about writing something new and tapping into new ideas. Yeah, I think um, if I think I try not to start from the same point, or, or at least always start from the same point. I think one of the things when you've got different <laughs> machines or different uh, plugins or whatever to use, it, there's always this tendency to go for the same thing. And I think as soon as I realize that, then I want to try something else and, and without having to buy something new and think, okay, that's going to bring me out of the comfort zone, but actually say, okay, I've been using this synth too much, let's try from maybe just from the drum perspective. Or I usually start with drums, but then, you know, more recently I've been thinking, okay, I'll start with synth lines and bass lines and stuff like that and then think about the drums. So yeah, just trying to move around as much as possible. Yeah, I'm always, I don't know about you guys, but I, I feel like I'm all, I always have like this library of little ideas that could potentially be an album, a new project, an EP with some person, like just, and I have so, and I'm, I become sort of overwhelmed by them. Um, and one of the, and sometimes they're like hangovers from older, like older albums that just, you know, they never turn into a song or it was just a clip or something. And so I find, uh, I find it, I struggle to start totally anew um, because I'm sort of constantly in process or constantly at the point where if I had to make an album in, you know, like three months from now, it could probably be done. Uh, so I'm, I have to like say, all right, they will, you know, there will be very little acoustic guitar on this particular record, or there will be, you know, th this, th th I have to limit the system that, I, that I'm working in. Um, and I guess it's sort of like, in a, like fortunately, I, I have this kind of running list of ideas that I could really expand upon if I needed to. Um, but I think that's kind of an Achilles heel for me because I'm sort of like, but this is, this is a, because I love solo guitar, like I love playing guitar. So I'm always like, but this is a nice guitar song or potentially one. And, but I'm like, yeah, but you've done that. Like you need to push your boundaries. You need to do something different. Um, currently, I'm in this, I have no idea what I'm doing. Currently I'm trying to figure out how to work with this woman who is an amazing, she, she works in data visualization. So she takes huge sets of data and she visualizes them and she makes them readable, understandable. And that's kind of her day job. What she does as an artist is she makes them like works of art and she's amazing. And we're trying to figure out how to, I mean we've done several successful uh, pieces together, but how to make a full show, the building blocks of which are all actual data. And I have no idea what I'm doing, <laughs> like none. I'm just taking the next step. Like I collect data on something and she visualizes it and then I take it and I turn it into music and we work together. And I like literally I have no idea if this is gonna work or not. Um, so I'm at this point where the visual project has now opened all of these crazy doors. I would never be at Loop had I not decided to put light on the guitar. None of this would have been happening to me. Um, and I think, though I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, lucky because I'm nine albums into my career. I've been doing this for a long time and suddenly like this, you know, it's just everything veered to the left and just, you know, I got to be parts of conferences and shows and imaginative things that never would have happened had I just stuck with only the guitar, which would have been a very satisfying life. Um, so I think there is something terrifying and something also very gratifying and easy about not knowing what the hell you're doing. Just like answering the email, collecting the thing, working with your collaborator, figuring it out, like, and not worrying so, I mean, well, I'm terrified about the outcome and I have, that's what I have to work on is like, it doesn't matter. The outcome will be either shit and no one will buy it and you'll move on to something else or it'll be amazing or, or it'll be somewhere in between or, does, or even whatever, it doesn't matter. It just matters that I learn something new and I work hard and I show up. 
That wasn't really the answer to your question. It was kind of it was a great <laughs> answer. <laughs> We've been talking about projects, sort of with a capital mm. P, in this kind of big sense, um, the whole time. But I'm, I'm wondering then, do you ever have these large-scale things that are in progress, and you've got, gotten quite far, and then you have to abandon it? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And I never look at it as wasted time. I, I look at it as I've learned something from that moment. When I'm, you know, I'm sitting probably on my, my computer, like back at home, has like hundreds of unfinished songs. And some of them, or most of them, are probably meant to be unfinished. They were <laughs> learning experiences. I probably learned a new trick mm -hmm. or a new way of like approaching chords or like uh, uh, arrangement or, or whatever and, and that's, the, that's the knowledge that I gained from it rather than it I have to put this track out it's, it's, it's so good but it's like 75% there and I can't figure out how to go from 75 to 100 sometimes you, you don't need to you just need to think about like the, the, the things that you learn from it and, and move forward I've been working on a Nick Drake you guys know Nick Drake? Singer songwriter mm -hmm. had to abandon it. I mean, I may not. I mean, in the future, something may happen. But my idea was of like, he's an amazing guitarist, one of my biggest influences. That I would play the songs and sing them and sort of em embody Nick Drake, and then through visuals tell a story of not his life because his life was actually very sort of sad and and simple, but the stories that the songs you know evoke and. Um, cannot sing in his range at all. So the guitar had to be tuned so differently that the guitar sounds start, stopped sounding like Nick Drake songs, period. And I really tried, like I really tried to make this happen. Also, incredibly difficult material to play and sing at the same time. I'm not much of a singer. And I finally just said, you know what, like I have to table this because it's not, it is just simply not working. And I really wanted it to, badly. I really wanted to like be, be this sort of, you know, someone that wasn't like him, but was becoming something that could like revive him and like allowed those that music to live in a live environment. And um, and yeah, it just was a total disaster. I never I never had to like perform it in front of people um, or workshop it, which maybe would have really been the point at which I could just said, okay, that was a failure. But um, but it was something that I, I, like, I couldn't let go of. Like, I wanted it too badly. And that was another learning lesson of, like, don't hold on. Just say, eh, you tried. Let yeah. go. Yeah, I think the same thing. It's like I've started using a small P instead of a capital P for all my projects because it just, yeah, it's just much more liberating. You see the things develop, and you can kind of, can then develop the path once you start to see which direction it's going. I think for me this year, there was also this one thing, oh, I have to do this particular, I want to create a body of work, I want to do an album, I want to do this, I want to do that. And then, yeah, that was exactly the point where everything started to really freeze up for me. And then, yeah, the minute I said, okay, it's going to come at some point, then, then you sort of see that window of opportunity much more easily. And maybe um, it actually, or at least from this particular year, I think the uh, tracks that I was able to produce happened a lot faster for that reason as well, because I wasn't like, okay, there's a set set goal and it was kind of like different pieces of a puzzle and then you start maybe here and then there's one down here and then slowly it starts to sort of give you a, a sort of a complete picture of what that project should be or how you wanted it to be, yeah. There was, this reminds me of something that we talked about, Kaki, when we talked on the phone, the, the idea that if, even if you have a capital P large project and it has a distant end state, the best you can do to move towards that end state is to ch take a tiny bite at a time. Absolutely. Little chunks. Yeah. Um, that's what I call, I call it doing the next right thing often, um, especially if it's something that involves a team, collaborators, which I've worked that I've been doing more and more, um, soundtracks, string quartets, string ensembles, et cetera, like things like that, you know, it's, I can, you know, the, the, the end is so overwhelming at times, whether it's, you know, I recently did a live album with Berklee College of Music. We took old, older material of mine, reorchestrated it, reimagined it, learned it, like with a conductor. I have not gone to music school, guys. Like I've, you know, I like 
all of my theory comes from playing drums in the ninth grade. So I had to suddenly like fake it and be this chick who could you know like be conducted, and this was all my material. It was terrifying, and um, and I like I could I was so fucked up about the live recording that would be the album. This was not going to be in a studio. We're going to do a live show with an audience, and that would therefore be and that was sort of like the they were trying to make this a format of of making albums with Berkeley uh, students and you know artists. Oh my god, it was so scary. That sounds terrifying. It's, it was so <laughs> fucking terrifying. It's awful. And the next right step to me meant today let's look at this music and let's like look at these eight bars that have been really hard. Also, just relearning music because they were going they were you know all the arrangements were written from recordings. And I don't know what I was playing 12 years ago. I right. mean, like, what the hell? Right. Like, I, you know, some of that muscle memory is, like, long gone. So I had to relearn this stuff. And it was like, just today, we're going to work on this 30 seconds of music and, like, you know, meet out what has to be done, what's doable, what the to-do, you know, what's, what's on the to-do list, and then just simply, like, work at it and be methodical and don't fucking think about playing in front of people, recording an album. It's, that's, you know... The preparedness was what I had to work on, and 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 then because then I would extrapolate into, but then it's going to be terrible, and then it'll be awful, and then no one will care, and then no one will care about me, and then I'll <laughs> die under a bridge. I mean, you just go straight there sometimes. Uh, so so yeah, the next right thing is a big like I say that to myself a lot. Where like even with the Nick Drake stuff, it was like don't you know this is this is challenging, but the next right thing is really just to finish the book that so-and-so wrote about him to learn a little bit more, to try to understand the lyric a little bit better, to just learn this, you know, the opening to three hours, whatever. It was not, it's all about just taking the, the tiny chunk that you can do that day, and that's the only thing. And if you've done that, you've had a great day. I love this next right step, it's really great. Um, it sounds, Jesse, like that's what worked for you, right? You mm -hmm. were stuck because you had a big vision but then when you threw the big vision out, all the tracks just started yeah. writing themselves. And I couldn't agree more. The next right step doesn't necessarily have to be music. And in my case, that was also the, the situation that, you know, there was some more administrative things to take care of, also personal things for me to take care of. And um, then, yeah, I think it's just a much easier way of approaching things. It's really like take the, the challenges that, or the, and maybe another way to phrase it, sometimes the challenges that you that are blocking you from doing the things that you want to do are slightly larger than actually making the music. So, That's true. you know, if you, if you do focus on those things, it does, you know, it could be really simple things. Your mind is just some, half somewhere else, you know, and um, yeah, that definitely worked for me. Travis, I wanted to ask you something uh, that we talked about before. You mentioned that if you have a creative rut, it almost always turns out that the problem is that the rest of your life is out of balance. Right. Like you're eating wrong or something. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. you're, you're eating wrong, you just like have bad habits, you're, um, yeah, you're, your mind's not right. You have to get your mind right and your body right. And um, you know, sometimes, especially as a touring musician, it's really hard mm -hmm. to, to have that balance. Uh, so then when you find yourself like coming off of the road and getting back into the studio and you don't have like a good, daily routine going on, it can be really hard to find uh, that inspiration or like um, really be able to utilize your time perfectly, um, especially when, when you do have limited amounts of time in the studio that's like in between touring, you know, and uh, yeah, a lot of times if, if like, like you said, if I, if I find myself blocked, I, I just have to go for a run or like, you know, clear my head somewhere, like get back into like a daily meditation routine or um, something that, that can, um, you know, clear my head a bit more. And that has nothing to do with music. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, in the music community, we all know people who suffer from anxiety, depression, substance abuse. Um, insecurity can be like a kind of, you know, symptom of larger issues and we're so people are so much more open to talking about it and speaking about it um and i which i find amazing and you know so to like to, you know if you're like i know people that have that like are brilliant and they've never been able to get it together enough to just make a record in any way and and 
some of those people like definitely have larger problems. And so, you know, be honest with yourself and say, do I need to seek help for something? Do I need to talk to someone about something? Um, there's so much less stigma these days, which is great. And it sort of ties into just the general self-care. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, there's, there's really, if you want to do something and you're incapable, that, that's relatively doable, and something has been holding you back for years and years, there might be something deeper to explore. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, it's interesting because there's a slight kind of balancing act, right, between the show up and do the work and figure out what's going on besides the work. This is, yeah. I guess everybody's got to figure that out for themselves. <laughs> like whether the problem lies on the fact that you're just not showing up or there's something deeper. Well, what is keeping you from showing up? Right. You know? Right. Um, is it just simple time management? Do you need to work too much? Whatever. Or is it like the fear of going forward is overwhelming? And um, which can have to do with a whole bunch of things mm -hmm. that I will talk about my <laughs> with my therapist <laughs> who will but not talk to me about Elizabeth Gilbert. So, sometimes the music ends up being the therapist. That's though. true. I know and, that. Yeah, and, that's right. And that's, right. that's how you end up dealing with a lot of those deeper issues. Or maybe it's not even really dealing with it. It's just hand, that's your way of distracting your, yourself from uh, whatever thing is like hanging over you, whether it's depression or, you know, like uh, some like family issues or, or what, whatever it may be. A lot of times, music can be that solace or that therapist, that uh, thing that bring that distracts you from everything that's going on. And a lot of times, you can find inspiration from that um, and, and trying to, uh, you know, deal with those issues through through music. Yeah, but if there's something preventing you from like, sometimes it can be too overwhelming that yeah. it's, it, you can't even be creative because yeah. you're not dealing with that that issue and you're just escaping by, you, you know essentially go, like writing music as an a, a addictive mechanism ra rather than it being like, you know, uh, a, a purely productive thing. It's like, I'm just trying to escape this problem by writing music and beautiful music can come from that, but it can also like get to a point where you're stuck because you just haven't dealt with that issue. I mm. just produced an album for a friend who um, is unbelievably prolific and write songs in the most classic sense. They're like Carole King songs, they're amazing. And was so stuck, and she met her birth parents. And that was it, and then wow. she made a record. She finally was able to take all of those songs, get into studio with me, and like, we did it. And That's beautiful. it was amazing, yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Um, we talked a little bit about what you do to begin. I'm interested in what you do to finish, because this is another... God, deadlines. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, they're stressed. really helpful. <laughs> yeah. So deadlines. I love deadlines. I love arbitrary deadlines. I love, I love them. I don't think I would be here without them. Yeah. Um, Self-imposed deadlines yeah. are like really important. What, if, if, you, if you're not working directly with a record label that's like you have to have it in by this time, yeah. it's really important to self-impose those deadlines so that you like, you know, it's not just up in the air and then stuff never gets done yeah. that way. Deadlines are great. Image and Heap booked a mastering studio a year away. Wow. Like a year from, the day, from that day, she booked the studio for, mm. the, for the following year and was like, that's my deadline. That's great. And, and like was building her home studio, was do, like just, you know, expanding her knowledge of everything in, in you know, to, to take, take, taking on a huge project, but she had this deadline and I was so, this was years ago, I was so inspired by that. But yeah, deadlines are very helpful. Even if it's like by the end of this week, I need to have these five songs mm -hmm. in this shape. Like it's, uh, they're, yeah. Yeah, I think they're important, but I, I think another aspect of this is to set deadlines that you can easily like, maybe override or even outperform yeah. because then you kind of takes a little bit of pressure off that yeah you're going to get something done like I was have this minimum like okay if I do let's say I don't know one track a month and I've got 12 tracks in a year and, and it's it just really simple stuff and then I know I'm probably going to do more than one track in every month but at least I've hit a minimum I can still feel good about myself and I think it's there's always this you have to find this balance between it not driving you crazy that you're going to have to get this done. Mm -hmm. I think the long-term kind of 
goal setting, like for example, having a mastering deadline in a year is, pretty, is a pretty good one because you've got plenty of time, whatever you finish with, you're gonna actually mm -hmm. really complete. And I think perfect is the enemy of the good. I'm, I'm all about sayings. I love it. But yeah, like really, per really, I'm like that, and that, that saying comes in many different ways and, and, and ways of saying it. But yeah, to let go of, to, 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 to be able to let go of the tiniest imperfections, things that you would rather have done a different way, just be like, you know what, it's fine. Um, I was just producing another friend of mine and she sang this amazing, amazing performance of this vocal line. And this tiny bit of it, I mean tiny, it didn't even really, you couldn't hear the clip, but you could see it go into the red. And she was like, we have to trash it. And I was like, are you fucking nuts? <laughs> like, we, I, you are, are you serious? Like, you've, we've taken all this time, you nailed it. We'll, this is fixable. And she's like, nope can't do it. And I'm like, oh, there's a reason we've been working on your record for nine frickin' months. <laughs> so yeah, perfect is the enemy of the good. Just let, let go of the tiny things. Because I think sometimes people hold on to them as a, as a way of excusing themselves from not actually getting to the finish line. It's like, the finish line's too scary. So these things that are wrong, I'm going to like hold on to and obsess over until they're perfectly right, which is not, that's an impossible goal. And nobody else will even hear those Oh, God, those no, yeah. of course not. And, or the mistake, the happy accident, the yeah. thing that you hate. I have several records where you can hear, like, terrible fingernail squeak or just something rough, and, you know, and it's, like, excruciating to this day. And people are like, oh, I love that part. And I'm like, what <laughs> the fuck? Yeah, they don't have that personal attachment to it. No. Yeah. And they weren't, like, they don't think that was a mistake. They're not The way that you were like, it. oh, no, I can, but but I, but I can play it so much better. And they're like, no, it sounds fine. It's humanizing. Yeah. yeah. No one wants to hear perfect music. They want to be able I want to, to relate play to it. Perfect music. <laughs> yeah. It's it's it's. I think it's our responsibility as as musicians uh, and artists to eventually abandon our work because it will never be a hundred percent done. Yeah. Um, it's it's always getting closer and closer, and like you can overwork it to the point where you've lost that original vision because you've just become way too obsessive over things that people won't even pay any attention to. Yeah, and, that's um, true. Yeah, you just have to, it's your responsibility to be like, all right, I'm gonna step away from this. And a lot of times that stepping away reveals what you actually need to change in the song when you come back to it later and you're just like, oh, that part was fine. Mm -hmm. I was like spending hours on yeah. that for no reason. Yeah. I'm really interested in the the psychology of this metaphor of the finish line, because mm. it's true, what you say is true. Like many people, as they reach, as they get closer and closer to the end, they push it away. But if you run, <laughs> if you do distance running, there's nothing more beautiful than a finish line. Yeah. Like right. all you want to do is be done. So why isn't it like that for making art? Like what are we afraid of? If because you finish and it's Because the finish sucks, line the of art thing. is the, the, because that's the start. That's actually the, the, the starting line. It's not, right. you know, you know, the, like I've done several, I'm not much of a runner, but I've done several small races. And you're right, the finish line's beautiful because I'm fucking done. Right. Like I'm really <laughs> done. When you release a project, when you finish something, when you get to move on, that, it's the beginning of that project's, you know, Birth your lack of control over yeah. it. Um, your, you know, someone might, someone will say something about it that might not be great. Someone might, People might not like it. People might, eh, you know, like, and you just get in your head about it. And I, yeah. I totally understand that. Um, so yeah, I think like the finish line for like for me is when I relinquish all control and I give it out to the world, and then I have to sort of like deal with the consequences, whatever they may be. And that is sometimes I, some, sometimes something I look forward to, and sometimes something I'm just like, oh, this is just going to be a nightmare. I and it's never a nightmare, by the way, ever. <laughs> There's just some asshole on YouTube who just writes dumb stuff. <laughs> and we all have it. We all have that person. <laughs> I personally, I fear the finish line because that's when the fun kind of stops. Mm. Like the fun is in the creation process, is in the mixing, like everything to like put together the, the work. And then like once it's done, it's delivered and you've got the masters back and you've approved everything and you've got a release date, just kind of like, 
oh, okay, now I'm bored. <laughs> yeah. Like I have to do all the... Well, then you also have to start to think about the next thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or thinking about how to put it into the live show, which is, it, it's fun, but for me, like, the, the real fun is in the creation process. So, yeah, as I get closer to that finish line, it's almost like you're watching an amazing movie or something and you don't want it to end, or I, I, I don't know. I don't know a good analogy for that. But. <laughs> so... Jesse and Travis, you both run record labels. And Kaki, you were just talking about producing for other artists. How mm-hmm. much of this work that you're doing for others is feeding back into your own creative process? I think a lot. Like, I learned so much about the people I collaborate with or just the whole process that goes into like releasing a record. And when you're releasing someone else's record, um, I don't know, there's almost even more pressure to, to make sure it's handled right and that you're doing right by them and, and that, um, you know, it, like for, for yourself, you know, you only have like your, your, yourself to blame, like, or, or you, you can externalize the, the blame as far as like if your record doesn't get pushed in the right way or whatever, but if you're actually like pushing someone's record and, and like really trying to make sure it gets as much exposure as it can. I don't know, there's this like special attachment to it that I never really had with my own work. Jesse, are you, are you releasing music by other artists right Actually, now? Actually, no, I'm You're only not. releasing okay. my own, but um, it's a similar thing, I think, at least for my own music, just to make sure that it's, yeah, that I've done the best that I could. And also, it helps me create that kind of finish line once I've said, okay, it's a download or it's, a, it's vinyl or something like that. It's, um, yeah, it's relieving in, in many ways as well. Once you've put it out there and then, you know, you know that you've done the best that you could for that particular, for that particular project. Um, yeah, I have, I, I have my own, like, record label, which is okay. a TuneCore account um, <laughs> run by my manager. I mean, it's, you know, but I am hoping that this record that I've just done... Um, that we decided to not mix ourselves, we're gonna have someone else mix it. Um, actually, I'm hoping to, this artist to be the first artist that I get to sign. Um, having, you know, I think for me, uh, when I got into producing, and like when I say producing, this is much more of the like, psychological talking to kind of thing, because I am engineering, I am playing, you know, the instruments, I am sort of, you know, working everything in my little studio. But I'm also being like, this song is too long. It is eight fucking minutes. It needs to be four. We have got to cut something. Because I've been on the receiving end of that, of that speech. And back in the day, I was signed to a major label, and it was hysterical because I'm like, the whole thing was a shit show. But, uh, but Polly Anthony was the head of Epic Records, and she said, the producer does not make the record that you want to make. They help you make the record that you should make and that you need to make. And I was like, ah. So um, being able to kind of give back this information that has been given to me, of like, same thing, like, you know, you played that fine, that's okay. This, this, this sounds perfect. My friend who won't let me, like, you know, just deal with the vocal track, well, we're not, she's not paying me right now. <laughs> so she thinks that she can just waste my time. She's got another thing coming to her. Um, but, uh, but no, I think also just in terms of you know, I had a very basic home setup, you know, just to make little recordings that needed to be sent off for a, you know, a demo or a commercial or something. And, um, and I worked that until I had my own room and then I put all the, you know, I just had, I, like, I built up until finally I was like, I cannot, I can't do this anymore. I need an isolation booth. So I gutted a bathroom and I made it into an ISO booth. So I think, you know, subtle ways of working with other people kind of make me realize the things that I need and could use, and now I have, you know, I get into my ISO booth and I like dial everything up on the iPad, and I'm like, here we go, and so I'm recording myself. Anyway, just little, little sort of steps forward for me that again are sort of in the more acoustic production world um, have, uh, have helped my work get better. I want to pick up on something that, that you were talking about before, Jesse, where you said you had a concrete example of being stuck, as in you had a big capital P project, and then when you let that go, that was the end of the creative block. I'd be interested in hearing from, from Travis and Kaki as well about like a concrete example of a time that you were really stuck in the creative process, but then you solved it, and to learn how you solved it. Hmm. 
trying to think of a specific example of that. I think, actually, for my last album, uh, for Human Energy, I had, um, in between the album before that, Vapor City, I was, you know, spending time on the road, and then I'd come back in the studio and just write whatever I could, and then go back on the road, and just had this whole cycle, and I, I couldn't really... The, the album just wasn't coming to me. It was sounding way too much like my previous work. It didn't sound like I was advancing at all, or, you know... Um, you know, it was just making a part two to, the, uh, to Vapor City, essentially. And then I decided, all right, I'm the only person that's going to put on the brakes with the tour and stuff, so, like, I have to just make a conscious effort to block out time to act... And it was the first time I had ever done that with an album, like, actually tell my agents, like, I don't care what shows come in, I'm, this is the time that I'm going to be working on my record. And I uh, created a template in Ableton so that I was only using these like uh, certain instruments, and um, so it limited um, me in a way that I could, you know, uh, just. It, it, and and the, the way that I created this template was all the things that I'd learned over that time of like trying to make an album. I kept finding these these little interesting bits like instruments or like VSTs or whatever, and then I just decided like, all right, I really like that one, I like this one, I like this one. Let's just like use all of those and make an album out of those. And, and just like having that, that new process and, and new approach and even just having the time uh, dedicated to, to writing the album just made the creativity and the inspiration just pour out because I had never really had that experience before. Um, I had made a album called Junior, which was weird for me. It was much more of a rock record. Some people like it. I do not. Uh, I was not living my healthiest life at the time. Um, I toured it in Europe and America, and it was insane. And after that, was I was about to turn 30, and I was like, is this it? Like, I have not had a job since I was 21. Like, I've only been doing music for almost 10 years. Like, is there anything else I may want to do with my life? Because after this point, it might start to get a little late. And at that point, my relationship with the guitar had become very antagonistic. I was like, I hate you. You're mean to me. You hurt. Um, and I did not know how to proceed except, and also normally when I go into the studio, I am like ready. I do not waste time. I work 10 hours a day. Like, I take very few breaks. I just, I'm very focused. And a lot of that comes from preparing myself by, you know, do, like, just practicing and making sure that, like, I don't go in there and waste time on a thousand takes. Um, and with this record, I didn't do that. The record I made after Junior is called Glow. And I also, I had sort of paired, I'd always paired electric guitars with other instruments, but acoustic guitar had mainly been left on its own. This time I was like, I don't care. Let's just, you know, I, I had a great producer. Um, Daniel Goodwin, um, and I was up in Woodstock. I just, I just kind of, I let go. I let go of all control, and I said, here are the ideas I have, here are the demos. Let's just be writing in the studio, which was something also sort of more new for me, because I would usually come in very prepared. Um, and it answered all the questions that I needed answered. Yes, I love the guitar. Yes, the guitar is amazing. Also kind of set into the, the chain of events that would then become the full relinquish of control. Because, again, I made this record and I had no intention of it being this way or that way, but suddenly we were, you know, calling up string quartets, calling up a, a bagpipe player of all things. Amazing how many bagpipe players there are in upstate New York, by the way. Um, and so, yeah, like that, that was, a, I was a time I was like just mentally, ag really in agony about whether or not I wanted to do this permanently for the rest of my life, what, that, what would that look like? Um, and so the answer was just to make a record. And when I made the record, and, and not, but not the record that I wanted to make in the way that I wanted to make it and the specific ideas that I'd had or the notes that I'd written, just get some guitars, go into the studio, fucking figure it out. Um, and it is a great album, and it led to many wonderful things. So that was a sort of, again, that kind of like, forget about you being the master of all of the stuff. Um, it was really helpful. That's great. 
I want to open it up to questions. I forgot to mention at the beginning, though, before we do that, that both Travis and Jesse, Travis, you, you're out under the artist name Machine Drum, and you're working under the artist name Abiomi. They're both playing tonight at Trezor, so if you're planning to go to that, you'll get to hear them. What time do you guys play? 2.30. Playing 1 to 3. It's totally reasonable. Totally reasonable <laughs> times. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> but you should check them out because they're, they're both great, and Kaki were great last night, of course. And I'd like to open it up to questions. Are there mics floating around? Okay, great. I can barely see, so... Yeah, I can't see. I'm going to trust someone else. Oh, I can see much better now. Oh. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, for those of us who maybe aren't just like complete beginners with software, but those of us who are learning things like synthesis, um, do you have sort of any tips uh, for those of us who sort of maybe we can design sort of basic pads, basic leads, basic bases, whatever, um, but when we sort of get stuck in that sort of mold, because there's a lot of different things where you can sort of look up tutorials on how to build things, and you know that's quite exciting, but I. I I find sometimes that it's hard to sort of get out of that sort of like structure of building up the same things and sometimes limiting yourself to uh, synthesizers that you don't know can lead to quite catastrophic sort of um, effects, if, if you know what I mean. So your question is how to get out of sound design mode? No, no how, sort of, yeah. How to sort of get out of that mode of sort of, I have to keep learning sound design because obviously, you know, focusing on sound design is important, but so if you get to a point where you've sort of been doing it for a little while and it's sort of how do I get out of that and get back sort of into a creative flow because I find that when I've sort of been focusing on the technical aspect then coming out of the technical aspect and trying to get into um, the creative aspect can be quite tricky. Well, I think it's all about dividing up your time, just being like, okay, I don't necessarily have any specific idea of like what this song is going to be, so I'm just going to experiment with... A plugin or with modular or like an instrument like and and just record a bunch of ideas and then you know after you've gone through an hour of, of twiddling knobs you can be like okay I'm gonna um, save that maybe don't even listen to it immediately because it's just gonna be noise at that point like it's gonna be really hard to to pick the 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 best moments out of those experimentations uh, but um, yeah, I, I think it is important to you know uh, experiment and let those moments live, and then even if it's just for like a five-second chunk out of like an hour recording, that's like amazing. Then it was all worth your time. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think the, there's a lot of separation between I think the creative process and and the sort of technical process, and yeah. I think there's always this danger, especially when you have all of this stuff in front of you, that you can do it all at once. And um, I think if you record things over a longer period of time and then go back to them, I, I know that for sure that a lot of tracks that I've actually finished off are things that I've maybe done a year or two years ago that um, I kind of drop out of frustration or not being able to move further with arrangement or something in particular. So yeah. Have any more? Hey, <laughs> hi. Um, okay, this is a tricky question because, um, yeah, I maybe have to put it in context. So <laughs> maybe uh, I'll tell a little bit. Um, what happened to us was uh, that I have a background in jazz and we started this project only with the um, idea of we want to go to South by Southwest and we were like, Woo you know, we don't know what's going to come up and we just make a make an EP and that's what we did. We went to the studio, we were there for five weeks. We hadn't met or done any music before that together and, and uh, we had no expectations and uh, we had so much fun. And we went to South by Southwest and it was amazing. We had amazing shows. Uh, people were totally blown away. And uh, the problem was that we got uh, a lot of success for the EP. And this is a weird thing to be a <laughs> like a blocking thing, but uh, it kind of um, made this whirlpool of people around us that suddenly, you know, 
everyone had an opinion of what we should do next and what our like album should sound like and there were like tens of labels and everyone was like ah, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and there was this like chatter of people saying that you should do this and you should be more poppy and then the other person would say no you should be more artsy and you weird and awkward and we were like <laughs> shit <laughs> you know what what do we even want to sound like and it kind of Uh, you know, led into a place where we made our album for five years. <laughs> mm. And uh, in the meantime, we, you know, started hating it. We kind of like, we, we went to a place where like everything was blurry. We didn't even know what to do. And then just suddenly we made the decision of like, fuck this, like sh shut everyone out. We moved to a fortress island. <laughs> And then it kind of came together, like, what we really want to do. But obviously, you know, five years is a long time to do an album. <laughs> so we uh, ended up publishing it ourselves and, you know, ended up getting quite good reviews. But then again, you know, I think the problem was the attention. Like, we weren't expecting it. And it was too much at the time for the creativity. And I don't know. This is, so my question is, how do you deal with external opinions and input in your own creativity? Ignore them. Yeah, ignore <laughs> them. <laughs> Unless it's coming from someone that you really respect yeah. and someone from your, your circle, like, it just doesn't really matter. Like, it's, it's good to know generally, like, what people think of your work, but don't let it affect you one way or another. And just hearing you talk about the initial moment of how the project even came together, like that sounds exciting and, and it's, it's up to you to tap into that moment, into that same, um, uh, the, the, the moment that the project came together. Like that's what, it, it, hearing you talk about this reminded me of uh, my collaboration uh, with Praveen Sharma, Sepulchre. Uh, we made an EP without even knowing it was going to get released. We were just friends making music, and then uh, some of the tracks got passed around through friends and then ended up uh, making its way to Paul at, uh, at Hot Flush, and he wanted to sign it. And then suddenly we had all this pressure to like make more records, or you know, we're like, okay, so what are we going to do now? And then there's this whole other mindset that you have that was completely different from when we initially started writing tracks together, which was just fun and we were hanging out and, and drinking in the studio and just like making each other laugh and you know, you, I think it's really important to, to tap into that original moment that like really excited you about writing music. Yeah, and even if what someone's suggestion or is, is maybe correct in a financial sense or a successful, you know, you, like if, you're, if you hate it and you're miserable in it, no amount of like, you know, career success is going to you know, be better than just being satisfied with the fact that you've done good work in the long run. And um, mm. so just, yeah, you have to tune that stuff out. It's hard because there's that guy on YouTube. <laughs> it's Fuck so that hard. fucking it's, guy. I hate it's him. always hard. It went down here? Uh, hey. Hello. Um, this is kind of directed because of a lot of us are now probably individual producers or individual musicians and we're working individually. I come from a jazz and classical background, sometimes working in orchestras and stuff. There's so many people that you're collaborating with or playing with in a every kind of day basis. Um, and going into the electronic world, sometimes you're by yourself all the time. How do you view collaboration as a creative thing? How do you use collaboration to increase your creativity? Man, I love collaborating because it's so, I feel like it's so easy. It's like the other person provides me with so much context, tone, uh, you know, vibe, all of it. There's so many things that I don't have to come up with on my own. And as a collaborator, personally, I usually prefer to, I, I like there to not be a democracy. I like someone to be in charge and someone to be doing as they're told. That's just my style. <laughs> and I don't need to be in charge. I actually prefer to just, You know, if someone says, hey, come in and play on my record, I'm like, cool, you just let me know what you want. Um, and if I'm like making a project or doing a thing and I need a sound that I want that I know a friend can make, I'm like, hey, just come in and like do this thing. Um, but I, I find that it's just so much easier and it just sort of happens faster because you have to schedule something or you have to be like in the same place at the same time. 
and there's less of that like whooshing around in your own head about what should be done. Mm -hmm. um, and so the collaborations that I've done, whether they've been with strings or whether they've been with other instruments or bands that I've had, have just sort of worked, they, they kind of can work smoother. Um, but you have to, seriously, I, if anyone's in a band here, someone just be in charge, just be a dictator. Like, democratic bands, it's just, it's the one place where democracy fails, I think. Um, just someone just be the one that just says, do this, do that, or else you're gonna spend five years was that one of your problems that you all just do? Yeah, see, one of you should have just said, let's, this is, <laughs> we're fucking this up. Or sometimes that's the producer's role is yes, to step in too. and to be the dictator and yeah. be like, all right, we need to scrap that, but also to be able to listen to everyone's ideas. And I think an important aspect of collaboration is trust. Mm. And if you don't have that trust, especially with, with strangers, with, mu with musicians that you've never met before and then you go into a room and you've never even vibed out and then you're suddenly expected to, to write a song, sometimes that could be so painfully difficult. Um, and other times you instantly vibe out with the person and, and you, you feel like you've always known them. So, and then that trust builds like very quickly. Um, but the trust is important because when you're working individually uh, on, on, on music, you, you go to the, all, all the things that you know work, and any things that like, you normally wouldn't try, you, you don't try because mm -hmm. you think it would be a waste of time. But when you're collaborating with someone and they have an idea that you wouldn't normally think of and your initial reaction is like, no, I don't wanna do that because that usually sounds like shit. Like they, you have to trust them and, and, and try it out because then sometimes you can find you know, new ideas based on uh, just like letting go a little bit and, and like uh, trusting the person you're collaborating with to um, yeah, inspire you. I think we have time for a few more. Hi, um, my name is Ariane. Uh, I just have a question for you guys. I wanted to do a recap of this talk. Um, you guys mentioned inspiration is really important for as a starting point. Discipline, um, deadlines are really important to finish something. Discipline, time management are, are essential to kind of put the things together. But how do you deal with the elephant in the room, which is procrastination? Thank you. Mm. <laughs> and, and please be as honest as possible. <laughs> I think if I've ever found myself procrastinating, one of the things I think I learned the most this year is just to keep moving. And if you really do find yourself stuck, then really just drop it. Because I think the amount of time that you can sometimes spend if it's trying to perfect something or trying to come up with an initial melody or mix something down, it's, it's, it's sometimes much more detrimental. And it's like what Travis was saying earlier, it's like sometimes that thing is a learning and that's all it should be. Should it just, it, it's finished because it's unfinished. Yeah. And then you just go to the next and you go to the next. And also, I think um, the other thing about procrastination is, set, is your own standards. If you set a really high standard for yourself, which I think everybody probably does when you're making music, um, that can be such an, uh, it can just really block you from, from moving forward in some way or another. So yeah, I think those are. Sometimes procrastination though, is like, I, it, you know, and I, I, we're all professional musicians. We make a living doing this. It's very important that, you know, it's like we do turn up for work as it literally is our job. And I'm, I have to manage my time very well. I have two children and, oh my God, like, whoa. Um, and sometimes I need to just go in my studio and shut the door and like zone out on Facebook because I cannot just jump in. Um, so I think that procrastination may be a way that you just, you know, and some people are better at it than others, sort of like, you know, tapping in and getting in the, the, the headspace. But it is really hard to like put pajamas on a screaming three-year-old and then like run down and like write some guitar song five minutes later. It's hard. Um, and so I think that there can be use, there is useful procrastination and then there's a procrastination that is, you know, you're, you're just... It's like a palate cleanser. Yeah, almost. like that, that's kind of what I need. So I'm, I'm totally okay with the fact that I need to just like go on the internet and look at Beavis and Butthead videos and like perfect <laughs> my Cornholio impression, whatever, like before I really jump in um, because it's too much. And then there's a the procrastination of like you're actually in terror of doing the thing that you want to do 
Um, and I think they're just two different types. The, the terror thing can be overcome by, like I said, just sort of like, even if the next right step is like opening the program, just open the program. If the next right step is then setting up your first track, just set up the first track. You know, like you literally can like mic make these things so tiny that the next step is just teeny teeny, like the little tiny mouse just climbing this tiny little ladder until suddenly you're just, you know, you're in. Um, so, you know, go easy on yourself. If you find yourself avoiding, there's avoidance too. And if you find yourself in avoidance, say so like, okay, what can I, what's, what's just one thing that I can do that'll like get me closer to my goal? Well, it's like you said, um, you know, there's useful procrastination. I, I used to have a rule where I would turn off the internet. I wouldn't <laughs> distract myself while working on music. But then I found sometimes I would, I would find the answer or the solution to whatever was bugging me in the track just by letting it play in the background and surfing the internet. Yeah. And then that one thing just pops out while I'm like focusing on something else. Like that procrastination can actually like lead to solutions break, yeah. sometimes. It's like taking a break in a yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And let it, letting your mind stop obsessing over certain things and uh, uh, the, the real important changes that you need to make in the song that you're working on, for instance, like will just jump out at you because you're not completely focused on it. Yeah. I'm super sad to say that we are out of time, but I, this was super insightful for me. I'm excited about taking the next right step. I have to figure out what it is. <laughs> um, but thank you to Kaki King, Travis Stewart, and Jesse Abiyomi. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.